Welcome to the Oxford Vineyard of Ohio online gathering for March 29th, 2020. I hope you're in good health and joining from the comfort of your home. Jesus valued joy. Joy highly motivated him. And as a matter of fact, joy led Jesus to his most noble act. Today, we're gonna to focus on the test of joy for Jesus. I'm Debbie Anderson. I attend Oxford Vineyard and I'm honored to be speaking today. Today is week six of the series on the topic of living a victorious Christian life. And I wanna thank the three pastors who've covered the previous week so well. I have a question for you. Where are you on the scale from being very anxious to, be, to being full of joy? How would you rate yourself if one was very anxious and 10 was full of joy? And one more question, what do you tend to do more of when you face trials? Let's be honest, do you tend to blame God and be upset with him? Or do you tend to run to him for safety and shelter? Hopefully you have learned that he is shelter in times of trouble. Hopefully we're exercising faith and not fixated on fear. He has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love, power and a sound mind. So how do we embrace reality yet hold on to hope and even joy in our hearts in these times? As you know, we're in a trial right now and perhaps for some of the greatest of our lives. We are in the midst of the pandemic of a highly contagious coronavirus. We stay home, businesses are closing, the stock market is out of control. Meanwhile, our health risks um, are by an unseen enemy. Every day, our life is on hold to some extent, and every visitor or package that comes to, through our front door presents a risk. So our response to this virus is a trial. Lent is a season where we reflect on Jesus and the events leading up to the death and resurrection of him. Jesus faced many tasks leading up to the cross. So Jesus was on trial. But how did he endure hardship? How did Father God prepare him for what he was about to encounter? What can we learn from him? If you look at Jesus, he indeed progressed through a series of tests, if you will, that Father God used to prepare him to face the cross victoriously without falter. It was the test of identity, of power, of betrayal, of obedience of crushing, and today the test of joy that prepared him for ultimate victory. God wants each of us, you and me, to be victorious when life throws us curveballs, when we encounter hardship or we face coronavirus threats. Now more than ever, we need to run to the Lord for protection, for peace, for vision. Celebrities and senators, young and old, rich and poor, we all have a common, unseen, insidious enemy. The cases of this COVID-19 are on the rise, as you know, in our country and even in our very small city. It has struck close to home. The threat is real. So how do you feel? Do you feel completely victorious right now? How can you grow greater confidence in your faith? That's what we'll look at today. Interestingly enough, this victorious series that leads up to the Resurrection Sunday was chosen last fall, long before the coronavirus outbreak. God's timing is amazing, isn't it? But now on to tests and trials. What if tests and trials were really for our good? What if they were an experience to strengthen us for what is to come? We moved our youngest to Chicago over a year ago for her first professional job in a chosen career. New apartment, new address, new adulting. It had been stressful getting there, but we were glad to actually be unpacking the U-Haul. There was a door to open the apartment building and then a door to our apartment. First load in, we propped open that outer door with a cooler. Second load, the cooler shifted with the weight of the door and a bit of wind. The door locked automatically one second before we were able to grab it. The keys, well, they were in the apartment upstairs. A burst of tears arrived. The thought of the $50 let you in your locked apartment fee added panic. As a parent, my heart ached. 
enter Papa Bear, also known as Kevin Anderson, to the rescue. It took him all of 20 seconds to break in the outer building door with the twist of a tool from his pocket. Crisis averted, $50 spared, but the most valuable was the lesson learned. Never forget your keys. As a matter of fact, have a spare. As my husband and I pulled away from Chicago, my heart was full. Father God used the trial to prepare our daughter. It was gonna be six hours away to have her keys with her at all times. She never got locked out again. Tests and trials can be far good to strengthen and prepare us. I saw that even though she was far from our reach, Father God was indeed looking out for her. The test of identity 2,000 years ago, Jesus' life, as he knew it was about to change after he rode a donkey into a palm-laden street of Jerusalem. What test prepared him for what is to come? He passed the test of identity at the beginning of his ministry three years earlier. As John ba the Baptist baptized Jesus, the Holy Spirit rested on him and the heavens declared, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. What a declaration. Jesus wrote that in permanent marker on a post-it note and pasted it on his bathroom mirror. Spoke it over himself every day. Okay, I am the son of the most high God. Father God is pleased with me. Okay, maybe he didn't do that exact thing, but he knew who he was in the core of his being. Just following that, the Holy Spirit, note it was the Holy Spirit that led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. So he fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and then the captain of the enemy team, Satan himself, faced off with him. After 40 days, Jesus was hungry. He'd been alone and was undoubtedly weak and tired. Today we call that hangry. Anyway, this was not a time for a flat tire, or time for a lost key, or time for encounter with Satan. If you are the son of God, was the beginning of Satan's trick question. Jesus didn't need to prove himself to this guy, but he knew he knew who he was. That voice from heaven, the, the post-it note on the mirror, but here he was challenged. Then Jesus remembered his armor, the sword of the spirit inscribed with the word of God. He merely said, it is written, done, victory. The score read, Jesus won, Satan, zero. The test of identity needed to be passed because at the end of Jesus' life, what was he on trial for? His identity. Judas, Pilate, the Jewish leaders, they were all conflicted about who was this Jesus. But Jesus knew who he was. He knew when to speak, when to let the trick question pass. He did not defend his identity, but he let his identity speak for itself. Then when there was the test of authority and power, Jesus had another test to pass. Would he use his power and authority according to Father God's plan to benefit or to benefit his circumstances and comfort? Satan is sly. And just like telemarketers, he doesn't stop with one question. Back to the wilderness and a second temptation. If you are the son of God was the invitation to battle. Basically, Satan was tempting Jesus to display his power and authority on a dare. The accuser was challenging Jesus to use his power. He passed the test of power and authority in the wilderness, again using the word of God, and then he won later at the courtyard where he was flogged. The one who was present at the creation of the whole earth submitted himself to flogging. Instead of the misuse of power, it was the restraint of power that paid the price for our healing. Isaiah 53, five says, and with his stripes, we are healed. The test of betrayal and rejection. Jesus was betrayed by a trusted disciple, Judas. His close disciple, Peter denied him and religious leaders sought to kill him. The Jews shouted, crucify him. It must have felt as if the whole world rejected him. How about you? Have you ever been betrayed or rejected? A sibling, a spouse, a friend, a church leader? Have you been accused of something you didn't do? 
Have your motivations ever been questioned? Have you been fired for false grounds? God wants us to know who we are. In spite of popular opinion, the paparazzi, or just one person who misjudges us, we need to perform for an audience of one, Father God. There will be some in our life who do not see our motivations and out of their own insecurities and fears, they need control, they betray us. That's just opposite of Father God. We're called to rise above, to believe in ourselves because he believes in us. When an accuser blames us, we experience condemnation. When the Holy Spirit corrects us, he always delivers truth in a package filled with hope. Some of us get confused because we listen to the wrong voice. We need to learn to know the voice and the heart in the direction of God versus the accusations, the lies, and untruths of the evil one. Although Jesus was utterly rejected and betrayed, God used a robber to show him acceptance. Yes, two robbers were crucified beside Jesus. Well, one taunted Jesus, the other recognized him as from God. Sometimes God uses the voice of one person to encourage us. Today, you will be with me in paradise, Jesus said. Then there was the test of obedience. Jesus was no fool. He knew his assignment was going to be rough. As a matter of fact, he struggled. In the garden before his arrest, Jesus went to pray and asked his disciples to pray with him. Don't we all love the company of friends when we're miserable? But they failed him. They didn't grasp the moment they were in, and they were mere men. My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. That's from Matthew 26, 39. Jesus prayed, if there is any other way to pull this off, let me know. There was anguish and sweat and sweat with drops of blood. Do you see the intensity here? Then his pleading stopped and he was resolved. What happened between the pleading and the resolve? I believe the Holy Spirit came to him and strengthened him. Obedience was born in the Garden of Gethsemane that was broken in the Garden of Eden. Isn't that beautiful? Sin began in the garden, but obedience to cover the sin was born in a garden. That act of obedience, of acceptance of the task that seemed insurmountable, shifted his whole role from operating as son of God to becoming savior of the world. From this moment on, his heart said yes to this new assignment to Father God, regardless of the cost. He was fully committed to please the Father and carry out his will. Fast forward to present time. There was a young soldier who was about to be deployed for his first time on foreign soil. He was interviewed, and in the interview he was asked, are you afraid of being killed or injured? The soldier replied, no, I am not afraid of being killed or injured. The only fear I have is to fail the mission. What a hero. Jesus was 100% dedicated in the Garden of Gethsemane to the mission. What a savior. The test of obedience was passed. The test of crushing. An olive is good to eat. Salty, juicy, tender, yet crisp, green and ripe, or red or black but an olive has so much more possibility. When olives are crushed, they produce oil for cooking, for light, and for anointing. Crushing squeezes the oil from the olive so that the olive is no longer distinguishable. Scripture talks about Jesus as being an olive branch. At the cross, he was so beaten and named that he was hardly recognizable. Crushing does that. Have you ever been crushed by life circumstances? divorce or financial pressure, family crisis, a career crisis. One of the strangest verses in the Bible to me is Isaiah 53, 10, where it says he, meaning Father God, was pleased to crush him, meaning Jesus. That word strikes me as so odd, pleased. I find it strange by virtue of the fact that the Father loved the Son, but let's look for meaning. 
Could it be that the father was pleased to see the man Jesus transformed into oil for the believers to come? Oil for food, he says, I am the bread of life. Oil for light, he says, I am the light of the world. And oil for anointing, for ministry. Jesus allowed himself to be crushed on the way to the cross. Olive to oil. Jesus passed the test of crushing. So how are we pouring ourselves out during this time? Are we caring for ourselves and our households? Are we showing concern or helping others as needed? Are we checking on loved ones, our neighbors, or elderly? Are we basically available to God for special assignments? I saw an interview of a nurse who was part of Samaritan's Purse on a Christian medical team in Italy. She said this was her 19th mission in 10 years. It was the first time though that she left a crisis at home to go to a crisis. What a hero. I am heartened by so many pouring out their oil to help. From a young boy who used his savings to buy food for neighbors to our everyday heroes, first responders and more. So we can be crushed in this season and feel sorry for ourselves, or we can be crushed and we can pour out our lives to better someone else. So let's press the button, the pause button for a minute. We're gonna do a reality check. So some people wonder, does God really love me? I hear that all the time. Does God love me because he has to love me or does he really love me? Does he love me when I do right or does he love me when I don't do right? I believe he loves me, but it's kind of from a distance and I'm not really sure how much he really cares. And last one is, I believe that he loves me, but he seems kind of stingy with his love. I wish I could believe that he was more generous. So this, friends, is confusion. It's hard to pour ourselves out if we're uncertain about his love. We want to end that confusion today. God's love is not conditional. It's covenantal. It's a contract. It's a relationship. It's binding, it's never failing, and it doesn't depend on you. He loves you in spite of what you do or not do. In Isaiah 62, four, it says, um, my delight is in her. That means my, the Father God's delight is in his church. Father gave us the best gift, Jesus, to purchase us from the power of sin. He didn't have to, he chose to, and he, chose you and me out of unending love. Father was willing to sacrifice his best. In 2016, I made a bookmark of declarations and it read, I am a child of God. Jesus is my savior. I am a daughter of the most high God. I am well loved and I'm learning to love well because I am well loved. I am well loved is my declaration. I have lived a blessed life but you do not want to be me, and I do not want to be you. You do not have the grace for my life, nor do I have for yours. My father died when I was six months old. My mom was widowed at 28 years of age. My niece died of cancer at 19. A family member was molested. A family member was addicted to drugs. A family member rejected my immediate family over a will. A mother-in-law died a horrible death of alcoholism. I was on bed rest for 12 weeks with my first pregnancy. I was misdiagnosed once and it resulted in surgery and treatment for seven weeks of miscarry and so forth and so on. But in spite of the hardships and trials I have lived, I have lived a blessed life. I came to Christ in college and learned how much Father God had fathered me. My niece did more in her 19 years of life with cancer than many do in a lifetime. Our family has deep and rich relationships with family and other believers that span decades. My husband and I are thankful to have three great children and a daughter-in-law who walk in faith and confidence. We adore two awesome little grandchildren and I love to encourage others with faith and get to do so regularly. My hardships have made me stronger. Faith has called me to do things like organize a prayer breakfast for sitting when I had no experience in such a thing. Faith has caused me to submit a proposal 
on Marriage Builder for State Law Enforcement Conference. Faith has called me to hold and comfort and speak words of love to a dying, dying infant on the OB unit when her mother was in surgery. Faith has called me to bake lasagna for the fire department, the police department, and a homeless shelter. I've passed out hot dogs and offered to pray for residents in Section 8 housing. Why? I think it's because of knowing Father's joy. It's not a loud parade or fireworks kind of joy, but it's a quiet, peaceful kind of joy where you know that you know you're pleasing the Father. You see, our scars, friends, are our beauty. Like a pearl, God turns our hardships into something precious and beautiful as we yield to him. Just as the pearl is created in the oyster shell by an irritation like an unwanted grain of sand, each irritation adds to our value. Scars are not a disqualifier in our story. They are a beautifier in the commodity of heaven. So what about Jesus? He knew he was well loved. He knew who he was. He knew his purpose. He was motivated by joy. So why did he go to the cross? Why did he stay on the cross when he could have called on a legion of angels to rescue him with one word? Anne Graham Lotz describes the scene of the crucifixion and she said that Jesus had to lift himself up in excruciating pain and with those nailed feet for three hours in order not to get enough oxygen into his lungs to stay alive for that long. The question, the answer to the question of the cross, my friends, is here in these 12 words. For the joy that was set before him, Jesus endured the cross. That's Hebrews 12, 2. For what? For joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross. What exactly is that joy? You, you are the reason. You were his joy. You, the thought of you, who you are, your value, the fingerprint of God on your life, your gifts, your callings, your insecurities, your strengths, your weaknesses, just you. The joy of seeing you in the kingdom instead of the kingdom of darkness was the reason Jesus suffered so horribly. Did he have to? No. Was he coerced? No. He willingly became a savior because of one benefit, joy, spelled you and me. Relationship, delight, joy. He didn't ask me. I have to confess that I would have told him it was too great a thing for him to, to do. But thankfully he didn't ask me. It was his choice. I was his choice and so are you. The post-it note we can put on our bathroom mirror reads, I am a son or daughter of the Lord Most High. He delights in me. So I just wanna say these four words now, uh, right now, and you can say them with me if you care, but I am his joy. I am his joy. I am his joy and I am his joy. I love the sign language for the name Jesus. It's two hands pointing to each other where his hands were pierced. That, my friend, is love. It's not love like roses or chocolate, although I'm sure he would like those things too, but it was his life for ours. When I get to heaven, I don't know what my assignment will be, I don't know what my robe will look like, or if my wrinkles will show, or even what color my hair will be. But I know what I wanna do. I don't have to imagine like the one song says. I wanna kiss the hands and feet of Jesus with a heart full of love. I can't imagine that I could do that without tears. I have heard though that there are no tears in heaven, but maybe tears of love and joy are allowed. I do know this, I cannot thank him enough. Many days I'm overcome by his love and amazed again, afresh and anew. God will use the trials of our life to strengthen us. James 1, 2 says, 
Count it all joy when you encounter various trials. And Nehemiah 8.10 says, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Corey Ten Boom was a Christian who hid Ger uh, Jews from Germans in World War II. She was arrested along with her family and taken to a concentration camp. She experienced many atrocities and cruelties while there. Many times Corey was angry, but her sweet, sweet sister Betsy was grateful. For example, rats and lice joined the women's close quarters in the bleak barricade. Corey could share her rations as an act of Christian love, but she was not thankful for rats. Betsy softly pointed out that the rats were the reasons that their captors left them alone. Did not bother them, if you know what I mean. They were safe and they were able to hold Bible study in their sleeping quarters. For the joy of leading others to heaven, Betsy and Corey endured the rats. So Jesus passed the test of joy. He was able to take his last, he waited to take his last breath until the right moment to be the gift of Savior. His scars make him so beautiful. His scars increase the value of the pearl. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. That's John 3.16. Make no mistake, dear friends. Jesus was motivated by joy. Joy led him to his most noble act. Joy was the thought of being with us. And what about us? We're not called to be the savior of the world, but we are called into this world to be victorious, to be conquerors and overcomers. So what are you wrestling with in the present or past? What is your fear about the future, the coronavirus, future job, future family? Hear this, God wants you to be victorious. He's given us a savior who was victorious and is our example. And he's given us the Holy Spirit to walk along beside us. We are loved. We are greatly loved. We are equipped and we are stronger than we think. As we close, let's bow our heads in a moment. Let's be quiet and reflect and look into his eyes of love. Allow him to commission us for the task. We are able to pass whatever test is before us. Take courage, we are destined for victory. The battle is not won in the moment. The battle is won by pre-deciding to follow God because he is our greatest treasure. A life first for me is as for me, the nearness of God is my greatest good. That's Psalm 73, 28. Okay, let's pray. Father, just fill us with your joy and your strength. Help us to see ourselves as you see us. Help us to see that hardships and scars in our life are tools to strengthen and beautify us. Forgive us where we've distanced ourselves from you and fill us with your love and your hope for the future. We receive your commissioning and purpose to live our lives from this day forward for you. Give us wisdom about our past and present to see how you've prepared us for this very day. Shine light on our lives and show us how to walk in confidence. Provide and protect our families, our community, our nation, and our world from this virus. And with authority from heaven, we speak out to this virus and we break the back of this disease. And we render the poison in its fangs as powerless in the name of Jesus. Fill our hearts with compassion and peace Help us to act in faith and not fear. Give wisdom to those who lead and courage to us all. Help us to be agents of your love, your power, and your wisdom in this very timely moment in history. We love you and declare our need for you. In Jesus' name, amen. So thank you for spending this time together. I believe there will be a little bit of worship to follow. I just extend love and blessing to you all. If you um, want to connect with me, I am at uh, P-S-A-L-M, the number one, T-H-R-E-E, -E, that's Psalm 13, 
at gmail.com. God bless.